We all know San Francisco for some of its icons, being the Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz, cable cars, windy steep roads. What you may not know, it's also home to a leaning skyscraper. No, it's not as iconic as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. However, they do oddly share the similar design deficiencies. And this is Millennial Towers. Millennial Towers was first proposed by the developers Millennial Partners back in 2002. And it was set to be one of the most exclusive, tallest residential towers in San Francisco. Another unique feature of Millennial Towers was the fact that it was going to be a cast in situ structure, where pretty much every other tall tower in San Francisco was made out of steel due to the founding materials it was on. The other towers currently in San Francisco were built up a much lighter construction methodology of steel frame structures and were actually shorter. To give you some sort of reference of the impact that this has on design, we give you the example of one of the most heaviest structures in San Francisco on 555 Mission Street. This tower is only 487 feet or roughly 150 meters and put a net pressure on the soil of 150 kPa or which equates to roughly about 2.4 kips. Whereas Millennial Tower was topping out at 645 feet or roughly about 196 meters and exerted a force of almost five times that of Mission Street topping out at roughly 545 kPa or 11.4 kips. So as you can see, not only the height of the tower was a concern, but also the force that was exerted on it. It should be noted that a tower of similar scale and construction methodology was rejected during the approval processes. This was aiding the Toma. It had a peer review that found serious design deficiencies in the structure and was subsequently rejected. A similar peer review was rejected by Millennial Partners as it may delay the project for years. And having passed through the approval process in 2002, construction was finally finished on Millennial Tower in 2009. And it was open to fanfare and winning many awards. It won many awards, not only for construction, but also architecture. So in 2008, it won the American Concrete Institute Award for Construction and the Con Concrete Industry Boards Award for Merit. It also won the two awards from the Society of Civil Engineers for Structural Engineering Project of the Year and Outstanding Structural Engineering Project. Well, with these awards, you think hindsight is 2020. And if they were looking back on it, they may have waited before giving it awards such as Construction Project of the Year. Now that gives me some insight. So what actually happens to these awards now? Does an engineer have an award on his wall for a tower that is sinking? Or is he now put into storage where it's collecting dust? One can only guess. In 2016, the public became aware of potential issues inside the tower when it was announced that Millennial Tower was actually sinking. Now, it is common for towers of this type of scale to shrink for a myriad of long and short-term actions, especially for an in-situ structure as well. So the short-term actions are essentially occurring from compression forces that are felt inside the column, known as elastic shortening, where the column feels stresses from above it and as per Newton's law, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. There's a minor shortening in the columns from the stresses that are seen. And as it is an in situ structure as well, concrete has some long-term effects that we have to consider as well. And this is creep and shrinkage. So over time, as the structure ages, the columns will essentially shorten from shrinkage. And they'll have additional shortening also from creep where the applied load slowly allows the columns to shrink over time. These type of actions are not only limited to the structure itself, but also associated with the footings. And any footing design accounts for the movements that it's designed for. So we apply a load on a soil, the soil will shrink and settle over time. So when you do design your footings, you have to make considerations for these movements and size your structure accordingly to limit the bearing stresses so you ensure that you do not have excessive movements. The engineers on Millennial Tower originally assessed the movement to be in the order of 14 centimeters or roughly 5.5 inches. The major concern with the tower was not only just it was sinking, it wasn't sinking straight as well, it was also having a slight tilt. And this tilt was increasing over time. At the time of the survey, it actually tilted more than two and a half inches out of plumb. The primary concern with the design was the piling system or footing system they had chosen. They had chosen to put in cast in pile friction piles 
and they only cast them into the soft material above, so only to a depth of 30 meters. During some of the early design phases, it was actually recommended to pile these piles all the way down to the bedrock, which would be a more stable material. However, due to trying to save costs and time, Millennial Partners decided to choose the friction pile solution. And this is where rumors started flying about some of the causes. And Millennial Partners were stating that the cause of it was by the Transbay Joint Power Authority, who constructed the Transbay Transit Centre, which is next door. This transit centre is also known as Grand Central Station of the West and was one of the key aspects to this tower through linking up the transit system so closely to it. In 2016, and as per American tradition at this time, everyone started suing everyone. So the residents sued both Millennial Partners and TJPA, the construction of the Transbay Transit Authority, and Millennial Partners sued TJPA as well for damages lost and media happened to descend upon this tower and from them descending upon the tower many discoveries were found such as moving sidewalks cracking differential settlement there was also trip hazards built all around the structure and some of the primary structures inside the building as well were starting to crack up quite excessively leading to great concerns that the tower was in great distress Court filings potentially found that Millennial Partners knew much earlier than when they announced to the public that the tower was in distress. Their filings stated that the problems started to occur in as early as 2011 and were caused by the dereordering occurring to allow for the construction of the adjacent transit centre. The developers of the adjacent transit centre, TJPA, refute this claim greatly as they say there was potential issues with the tower even before they had broken ground where from their observations and surveying of the tower at this time, two thirds of the settlement actually occurred prior to them even starting any of the works in this area. And from their filing, they were claiming that the primary actions of the tower was due to the severely deficient designs of the footing systems in the structure. They had also gone above and beyond their design to ensure that the structure would not affect the design of Millennial Towers. Through the construction of a buttress wall on the side where Millennial Tower existed, essentially what they needed to do was drill a series of contiguous piles adjacent to each other, all the way down to the bedrock, to essentially create a cutoff wall to prevent any damage to the structure. This was at an additional cost to construction of the transit centre that cost taxpayers an additional $60 million. So as far as they were concerned, they'd already gone above and beyond prevent additional damage to Millennial Towers from their construction. And at this point, concerns started to grow with the design of this tower and many surveying points were actually taken at this time. There's many drones flying around surveying the structure. One of the drones actually ended up striking the tower and coming crashing down onto the sidewalk. In 2017, the approval body for San Francisco inspected the tower and deemed it safe for habitation at this point. Then in early September in 2018, Creaking noises were heard throughout the tower, with a loud popping noise occurring at roughly about 2.30 a.m. When the sun rose, they woke up and observed the tower. They found that the tower had actually had one of the windows cracked. This increasing the concerns of the residents inside the structure is it actually safe to live in. The tower settling into the ground is a big concern. But what was more worrying, how would this tower perform under an earthquake? You may know that San Francisco is home to one of the most famous fault lands, the San Andreas Fault. And this fault, predicted by seismologists, sees a major earthquake roughly every 200 years. The last one was back in 1857, almost 165 years ago. And over time, the stress is built up inside the tectonic plates, predicted by seismologists, that potentially an earthquake the magnitude eight could potentially be seen to this area. They're also predicting that a damaging earthquake in the Bay Area has a three in four chance to occur at any time this year. So the earthquake's safety design and how this building will react in an earthquake is highly concerning. Another issue, especially with the area that was built in, is that this area is subject to potential liquefaction. And liquefaction, as the name suggests, essentially causes the ground underneath the tower to turn to liquid that causes the building to settle into the ground greatly, causing major damage to the surrounding structures. 
The most recent event of damaging effects of liquefaction was back in Christchurch in 2011, where a series of earthquakes struck this area, with the peak one peaking at 6.2, causing major death and destruction across all of Christchurch. As we can see from some of these images, the towers essentially sunk into the ground, and even vehicles and other elements sitting on top of the ground could not withstand this liquefaction damage. So the damage from this liquefaction is obviously highly concerning for this tower, as it is not founded on the bedrock, which would be solid in such an event, but in the much softer clay materials up higher, which would potentially liquefy during such a major earthquake event. To fix this sinking tower, the chosen solution was essentially proposed by Ronald Hanberger, a senior principal engineer at Simpson, Grumman and Heiger. I probably butchered the name, so I'm sorry for that. What they proposed to do was to lay a series of piles on the north and west sides of the tower, the side that the tower is tilting towards, and then these would be tied into the current footing system. And at this point, these piles would be all the way down to bedrock, essentially founding these two sides onto solid ground. Then over the next 10 years, the tower would slowly settle, pulling back as much as 50% of the current tilt of the structure, at which point the other two sides be piled as well bringing back the whole tower to be founded on the bedrock material, anchoring it in to the design that was originally proposed to found structure onto the bedrock early on during the design phases. With this chosen solution, it was actually one of the cheapest solutions to fix this issue, coming in at roughly only 100 million US dollars. And construction of this rectification has hopefully started in November of 2020. Also in 2020, a settlement was reached between the residents, millennial partners, and the Trans Bay Joint Power Authority. There's rumors that the settlement came in as much as 500 million US dollars, which would do account for not only the rectification works required onside the tower, but also to cover for any losses and hardships the residents may have felt through this damaging time. Like many of these cases, there's normally not one issue that causes the tower to fall down. Would it have been better if the whole tower was founded onto the bedrock? Most likely. Did the dewatering of the adjacent Trans Bay Power Authority exacerbate the issues in the footing design? Maybe. Would have the peer review picked up these deficiencies in the design? One can only guess. There's obviously many lessons that engineers can take from this situation. Like, not to overlook the footing system, which can be highly critical to the final design of your structure. And to also always encourage those peer reviews, as there may be something that you overlooked at. Not be something that engineers should be scared of, but actually something they should be taking and hope that any of their designs would hold up to such scrutiny. Myself, I actually enjoy having peer reviews, as I would hope that any of my designs would hold up to such scrutiny as well. I hope you enjoyed that this episode, and if you did, please hit that like button. That's what it's there for. Is there any other buildings that you want me to cover in detail? Please comment below. I'm always up for suggestions. I'll link a video here to the engineering behind an engineering masterpiece in New York, 53 West 53rd Street. Below that, there'll be a recommendation from YouTube of one of the videos that it thinks that you will enjoy. If you haven't subscribed at that point, please hit that subscribe button. And to get all updates, you need to hit the bell. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.